The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today, as we record, this is Ash Wednesday, uh, where on the panel are Father Michael Gossett. Hi, Father Michael. Hi, Don. And Thomas San- Sanjuro. Thomas? Hi, Don. How's it going? Good, good. So I still have my ashes only because... Uh, I got them about uh, two uh, two and a half hours ago. <laughs> we were late. Usually by like noon, my ashes have been wiped off because I'm a I'm an inveterate head rubber when I think. I, I, I rub my foot. <laughs> but uh, it is Ash Wednesday. Welcome to Lent, folks. I don't say Happy Ash Wednesday. It just seems kind of weird to say Happy. But yeah, I've always <laughs> felt that way too. Where it's like I don't know. I'm not. We're trying to be contemplative, right? Not happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Lent, folks. That's right. <laughs> I was so weird shaking people's hands at the end of Mass on Ash Wednesday. Like, yeah, we just talked about death and penance. Let's have a good day. Yeah, have a good day. Have a good one. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let's jump into our, uh, our tech news for, the, uh, for this week. Uh, so the first story that we're coming up is a story that a lot of Americans might not know about unless you're, you're digging through te- tech news. It's an EU story, but it has implications for everyone, uh, whether you're in the U.S., North America, or otherwise. Uh, And it's about this new law that the EU is contemplating that's coming up for a vote later this month. uh, EU Copyright 13, it's called, and um, or Article 13. It's the new copyright directive. Now, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of what of copyright law. But basically, the the law as it stands now is, is the person who creates something has the right to profit from it or control it for a period of time. And that period of time has varied over the years. Um, but when, at some point, that copyright then expires and it becomes public domain and available. That's why you see Jane Eyre movies over and over again, or King Arthur movies over and over again, because those things are copyright free. Uh, then there is something called fair use, which is, well, you know, just because someone has copyright, you, you want to be able to have people that have edu- educational use of it, you know, use it in classrooms, um, or commentary. And that's kind of what we do in a lot of our podcasts at StarQuest. We have shows about movies and TV shows, and we talk about them, and sometimes we, we play clips from them, or, or they, but, as, but it's as part of our discussion, and that's called fair use. Now, the reason that this um, law, this proposed law in the EU is, so, is, is drawing so much attention is because it would put the um, onus on the tech companies to police copyright infringement ahead of time. The way it works now is if a, if a copyright owner, say a, a movie company, sees someone has posted uh, a, 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 ver- a copy of their latest movie on YouTube, they it's up to them to alert YouTube, and then YouTube takes it down. Well, now they want to put the onus on these companies ahead of time to kill the, the copyright infringing material uh, be- before it gets noticed. And if they don't, uh, do that, they, they'll they get fined and, and all kinds of stuff. And th- this is a problem because it is impossible humanly or technologically to keep up with all of the stuff going on out there. So, so I guess I just want to like bring up like some of the implications of this. Um, what do you think of, I mean, the, the, the tension here between the, the, the keeping the, 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 the copyright owners, their right to their material versus the right for people to have fair use, but also to be have access to the, these companies that might might have to shut shut their access off to to Europe, so they're not infringing. What 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 do you think about this 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 potential problem? I'm really interested in how this is going to affect uh, the video gaming industry because uh, Twitch streamers are essentially using copyrighted material mm-hmm. and they're making money off of it, but. Uh, video game companies want that to happen because it sells the game. That's, I mean, Fortnite would not be as huge a phenomenon as it was right now if it weren't for Twitch streamers. 
Right. Uh, so, you know, this uh, this gets into a lot of gray areas about what it means to kind of share media and to talk about, you know, like we're doing right now, talking about media that's, uh, you know, that's out there or, you know, when we do any of the uh, any of the, the movie podcasts so that that's uh, it, it would be really interesting to see how that's going to affect that industry, because they're ones that definitely don't want this kind of protection. Right. I mean, right now they don't file takedown notices on all these Twitch streams. Twitch is a website that allows people to stream what's on their screen and uh, and you can hear them talk about it as they go. It's mostly used by gamers. Yeah. And you don't you, they don't file copyright uh, claims against them because they like you said, they want them there. Whereas if these if these um, they're called common carriers is one, is one way to refer to it, Twitch or YouTube, um, if they if they have to do it ahead of time. They're not going. To, they're not going to say, "Well, we're just going to assume that the video game company wants us there, so we're going to have to take it down." And that would just right. shut down Twitch altogether. Um, so yeah, that that that's that's the sort of case where yeah, it will kill a whole area of content um, that that nobody, including the copyright owners, wants to see go away. It's a real shame because I mean that's it's one of the most beautiful things of the internet is that sort of sharing what we've experienced and uh and comment like commentary is a big part of it and i think of so many movies i've watched or books i've read or things like that because people dive into it in a youtube video or a podcast right i think so twitch is a good example for video games but it happens happens with a lot of stuff uh and i think in the long run it would hurt a lot of of these copyright holders because people uh they generate interest in their stuff because you can talk about it. And just if suddenly this affects the EU, it's like we all lose the big part of this ecosystem that that's grown up because that's what the internet is. It's, it's worldwide. And uh, it'd be a really sad thing to, to see it break off into these different sort of segments where different laws apply. And I think that's, it's one of the harder things that for all of us to understand is just like, Oh yeah. Like, the internet's this wild west, but yeah, if the EU decides this is what the law is, suddenly you lose a lot of that freedom. Right. I mean, we already see like th- with, where with China, we have the Great Firewall of China, where China blocks so much incoming content, and they require some of these companies to do some of this uh, filtering for them if they want to do business there. Um, and then we, you know, so we're going to see the EU do this, and then maybe like in South America, some countries will do it, and then suddenly we've we've balkanized the the internet into these these little areas where certain things work and other things don't but one of the things that the warnings is that if if this goes through companies like youtube google facebook they're going to have to shut off access to these these countries so people who live in the eu will not be able to see this content will not be able to experience it i'm thinking like sqpn will have to like somehow prevent our podcasts from being made available in Europe, I mean that that just that that kills me. I wouldn't. I'd hate to see that. Um, Europe... A lot of IP address checking going on there. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, you know. I think what they. I, I can only guess the lawmakers are probably thinking of this the way that they were thinking of the uh, the cookie warning. You know that they were thinking, okay, this is something that we can probably we can make people brainstorm a solution to this. Uh, they just have to warn the you that there are cookies collecting your data. And you have to agree to it before you can go to their website, and everybody can apply it to the entire internet, and no, no harm, no foul, right? Uh, but they don't—they really don't have, you know, the, the technical think through to say, well, these companies really—they're not going to take a chance on that if they're going to get fined. It's, it's a lot easier to make a pop-up that says we use cookies on this website because everybody does, right? <laughs> right. And so, but knowing which video is copyright infringement and which one's not, and being able to predict it actively, and uh, you know, if anything gets through, then all of a sudden you're getting slapped with a fine. There's no way they're going to take that chance. This there's something like literally like a million minutes of video being uploaded to YouTube every second. <laughs> it is literally yeah. impossible to check that stuff as it goes up you know one of the things you said about the the the, you know like the lawmakers oh we'll make the law and then the tech guys will figure it out they'll just figure out a way to make it work and it just drives me (laughs) crazy because i i hear our you know american lawmakers doing that too they're like well we're gonna pass a law that says oh there was one silly one um that the phone like your phone has to uh turn itself off except for like gps and map stuff when your car is moving like this crazy like 
and like how like how does that work and you know then they're like oh those, those tech guys are smart they'll figure it out it's <laughs> not magic <laughs> yeah it, it doesn't work that way that's not how the force works <laughs> <laughs> it makes me uh, yeah. think was it mark Zuck- zuckerberg who had to testify uh, <laughs> yes. for a committee and they were basically asking him how facebook worked and right uh, that's kind of a problem when when it's at that level of explanation and things like fair use just bring up people don't agree about this like we we live in that gray area and there's uh i mean you see fights on youtube about it where some movie maker doesn't want somebody commenting on their video maybe it's just because they don't like what they said but uh right um so to put that into the hands of either the government or just to take away that option at all is a lot bigger than I think they realize. So, uh, folks, if if you are a uh, a citizen in the EU, uh, I encourage you to contact your uh, your member of parliament because they're voting on this at the end of the month, at the end of March. So, uh, so you you probably want to talk to them. And otherwise, you know, for the rest of us, just uh, you know, keep an eye on stuff like this. Uh, be aware. <laughs> It's just because it's happening in Europe doesn't mean it's not going to happen here. Uh, there are companies out there like, you know, say like Disney, who would love to protect their uh, their trademarked, copyrighted materials with even stronger laws. And so we got to stay on top of, of it uh, and keep an eye out. We'll have some links in the show notes to uh, articles on this. Uh, Boing Boing, uh, which has always been on the forefront of this uh, intellectual property sort of news. They have some articles on it. So I'll, I'll link to that there. So. Uh, so I want to move on to our second story uh, this week, it's, which is on um, Apple's coming news service. So everyone knows about Apple's got a streaming video service uh, coming. We talked about that uh, last week about their streaming video. Well, Apple has a news service. Now, they, have, well, they already have the Apple News app, and that's sort of the first step in that direction. But last year, they bought a service called Texture, which is a uh, sort of Netflix for magazines. That's how it's described. And... There's some speculation, uh, or not, more, more than speculation, there's some information that they're going to roll out a, a, a Netflix for news, where you can pay a premium level to get access to all these news services, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, all the, all the big news organizations. Uh, but apparently, there's been some pushback. And uh, so I wanted to kind of chat about that a little bit. Um, the, the, the news companies are saying that the uh, the terms uh, that Apple is offering aren't good enough. Uh, so, so you know, the, the, I guess my question is, so what do you think is, what is the, the best way for news to really survive in the current environment? Again, we, like another, yet another part of our society that has been changed by the internet, um, you know, news organizations, everybody's still scrambling how to, how to make a living at it. Uh, what do you think about this tension between what Apple's trying to do and what news organizations are trying to get done? It really is a tension. Uh, like my dad uh, just retired from being a local newspaper reporter and just seeing how papers like that, I mean, it's, it is going away. And uh, every time I come face to face with a, with a paywall on the internet or the uh, Wall Street <laughs> Journal or whatever, right. I, yep. m- the question <laughs> in my head is, does anybody pay for this? And I don't really know because I don't. And so an Apple sort of a blanket thing is sort of attractive to me because I would love to be able to access all this stuff, but I don't see myself subscribing to every single newspaper because you just don't know. You, you get sent links and some of them you can access and some of them you can't. Um, but then again, I understand the, uh, the media's, maybe their fear of getting into it. And also, is there is this another thing that we want to put in the hands of Apple that we let them control all of this and we pay them for all of this? Apple or Google or Netflix or yeah. Facebook, you know, the the yeah. uh, the big five <laughs> tech companies. <laughs> well, that's the that's a, the the thing is like with news, like I, I don't like uh, like Miami Herald is not my local paper. I live in Boston. I I read the Boston paper. But sometimes I'll get an article, a link to an article in the Miami Herald or or very often like the Washington Post, and I want to read what the article says, and I'll click on the, like the Washington Post is notorious for me on this one. I click the link and it says, sorry, you have to subscribe to get this, or um, you have to turn off your ad blocker, uh, which I'm, I'm willing to do that for certain sites, but for certain sites, they've been naughty about their ads and where they, they kill my browser. I can't load or read the article. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to read it that much. And right. so I'll, I'll, go, I'll go away. 
and it's like if I could get a service for ten bucks a month, maybe That's still pretty steep for for news for me. But and I, and I'm a news reader. Uh, but uh, you know, if I get a service that gave me access to all this, like like Wall Street Journal is behind a paywall, and New York Times, well, some of their stuff is there. I could I could see that, but uh, go ahead. Thomas. A lot of people might not know that you have access to this, uh, possibly through your local library too. Um, a lot of libraries now have access with using OverDrive or uh, Hoopla uh, or apps like that. That you can access a lot of newspaper articles through those uh, digital uh, content uh, uh, arenas, and it's your library card. You know, so you're you're already paying taxes to get that thing. You might as well go and check it out. Um, I, I, I really, I'm the same way. Like if I see a paywall, uh, I didn't want to read the article that badly. <laughs> right. Honestly, that's, that's, that's just it. And I'm going to move on somewhere else. And, and 99 times out of a hundred, I'll go find a tech blog or another blog that I know of, uh, that will have like the takedown, you know? And so they'll, uh, have like the, 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 the Cliff's notes version of whatever it was <laughs> that I was going to be reading on that site anyway. Right. And it's a shame because, you know, all of this good reporting has to be done by professionals who have the time and the resources. To, I mean, if, if, they, if these news organizations, news organizations don't exist, who's going to do the reporting? Not, not bloggers like, like me. You know, I mean, I don't have the time or the expertise to go out and, and go look at it. So, you know, on the one hand, we, we, we want these organizations to exist, but how much are we willing to pay? And then we have a situation like this where Apple is says, all right, we have the solution. We'll bundle you all together, sort of like the like cable, and we'll charge one flat fee for people, and then we'll spread the, the wealth out among you. Um, but the news organizations are saying, well, they have some objections. Like, well, you know, Apple wants to keep half of the subscription revenue. So that 10 bucks a month, they get five. And then the other five gets split up among everyone. And probably 90% of that goes to the, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. You know, I mean, that's the, the big one. And then everybody else gets the, the piddly bits after that. And Apple is notoriously in favor of privacy for its users. So it's probably going to prevent the, the publishers from getting access to data about the readers, which prevents them from, you know, selling ads and information related to that. I could see where they're balking, but on the other hand, you know, it's a barrel that they're over. In, in I guess, I mean, it's a it's a tough situation, and um, I'm not sure what a good solution is. Is maybe it's consolidation? Maybe it's maybe the the solution is fewer news organizations. What do you think? Is that is that you think it's okay? That's worrisome too, though, because you already have a, a quite a small population of, of ownership of all of the newspapers in the country. So it's the the more you reduce that, the more the media is just in the hands of like a small group of people, right. and that can be dangerous for lots of other reasons too. The comparison I keep coming back to is uh, is iTunes that we went from kind of like you you buy your your CD wherever it is, but now iTunes or Spotify, Apple Music, all these things that music comes in these very sort of pre selected ways. Um, and now you can't share those files with anybody that, that they are, they're stuck in that place. And uh, it works. It works really well. Um, yeah. And the fact that I can sync my music between my Mac and my iPhone and whatever service you use, but there, it is kind of, you have to understand that sort of uh, concession that you're making, that you're taking away that opportunity for those kind of like scrappy little outlets. And I could see that, the danger with news, uh, if you lose those independent sources, you lose a voice, you lose uh, potentially someone that will be critical in a way that uh, maybe if they're making a ton of money, probably not th through this, that uh, they're willing to, to push those questions. That's true. Yeah, the, the, fewer, the fewer voices when it comes to the fourth estate, the worse off we are because uh, you, and you tend to, those voices tend to sound a lot alike. Mm -hmm. as as we as we get fewer of them so that's true that's true you know um when you talk about the music one one area where they've kind of fixed one of these issues is uh with movies uh you know it used to be if i bought my mo uh, movies on amazon well i had to keep amazon to to watch it or itunes i had to stay on itunes 
But now with uh, Movies Anywhere, I don't know if you've seen that, it's a service where if you sign up, all of your movie purchases are portable. So if I buy a movie on Amazon or iTunes or Vudu or any of those services, I can watch it on any of the other services that I that I sign up an account for. So if I buy it on Amazon, I can watch it on on my on iTunes on my on my Apple TV, for instance. So uh, you know there are solutions out there for these various problems, and I'm hopeful that they'll come up with one. But um, you know this is a this this tension between Apple, the mute news organizations, and consumer habits, especially since consumers are are consume are, are looking at less news of a of a longer nature. They they're they're relying more on you know listicles and BuzzFeed sort of <laughs> viral sort of news sources. We've got to you know we need more news, not less. So uh, so mm -hmm. that's my pitch for for the news mm -hmm. industry. So um, we have our our next story is um, a little uh, a little story. You may have heard about the Momo challenge, and uh, this was something that went across Facebook and Twitter, all the all the social media recently, warning parents that hidden within these YouTube videos for kids are these is this Momo challenge, which is this bizarre looking uh, harpy ish creature, like horror creature uh, that gives your kids tips on committing suicide or some, something along those lines. Uh, I didn't pay close attention because, frankly, when I saw it, I knew it was ridiculous because uh, <laughs> it's another one of these things. But, apparent, but enough people took it seriously, including, let's say, news organizations. News organizations, <laughs> uh, there a, they are. <laughs> a lot of local TV news, especially, they took it seriously. We're warning parents about this. Um, but it turns out it was all just a big hoax that, the only people who actually believed it were the parents, not the kids. Frankly, so uh, Thomas, you you said you you'd heard some something about this. Did, did you have you have something you wanted to, to you know a little bit to say about this sort of challenge, this sort of hoax? Yeah, it's um it was interesting because uh I I teach and so I have a uh, K through eighth grade, uh and they were talking about it. So the kids had started talking about it because the parents were talking about it and warning their kids about it. And um, so, you know, I sat them all down uh, and I'm, I'm really big on talking about safety online and all of that kind of stuff. And, I, and I, I, the way I put it to them was this, that this is an interesting thing because uh, they all understand memes. They all understand memes very well. It's, it's shorthand, very funny way of presenting information and sharing information across to each other. And I told them that, you know, we, that's because that's the way we tell jokes now. We don't we don't sit around and tell jokes quite the way we used to. We just share memes with each other. And this is exactly like a meme, but a, a scary story. And so, you know, it, it, I, it just hit me how much this is like, uh, you know, it's like the old urban legends or, uh, you know, just sitting around a campfire and uh, shining a flashlight under your chin and telling a ghost story <laughs> while you're out in the wilderness. Right. And and the internet's kind of become our wilderness now. Like people don't know it. They, it's it's weird. It's uh, a little bit not uh, easy to understand. Yeah, it's 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 that like the idea like for a lot of parents of a certain age, the internet is 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 enough of an unknown quantity that you can kind of believe that a video would cause a kid to want to commit suicide. Like because it's it, the internet is a little scary. And a little, un a little wild, and you're, you, you, as a parent, you're kind of afraid to let your kids there. So you kind of, you're ready to believe that that something like this could happen. Uh, it, it, the, the, this is not the only time this has happened. I'm, I'm constantly seeing these like warnings going around about, oh, you know, kids are doing the, I don't know, the cinnamon toast challenge. It could kill them. <laughs> And it's like, <laughs> nope, nobody's doing this <laughs> until right. you start publicizing it. The this this meme is itself the viral payload, so to speak. Stop exactly. spreading it. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's so that's. I mean, if I have any advice for for parents, like when this sort of stuff comes around, sit. If you have a kid of this age, sit him down and ask them, "Have you heard about this? Is this anything?" And more often than not, they go, "Mom, Dad." This is this just a stupid thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and your kids will be right. Yep. Uh, there yeah. are there are a number of um, anti hoax sites. If you don't like, um, um, what's Snopes. the theme? Snopes. Snopes. Yeah. yeah, some people don't like Snopes, but there's another one called hoaxslayer.com. That's a good one too. 
always go to those first and and mm -hmm. and look for it there because more often than not they'll they'll it'll be right there at the top of the page because it's already become a big enough deal so right Excellent. and i and i really like this vox article that 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 uh that we have in the show notes because it, it does a good job of a of like uh dissecting the whole thing and how it became what it became right and and, and kind of giving that that lie to it like hey look you know this is it, it wasn't a big deal until we made it a big deal. and then it, and that's it's all a, it is. <laughs> it's a good education in how uh, in in how these things work and how you can be sort of prepared next time one of these comes around and not to get all because just because you see it on your local news doesn't mean it's true. Local news is really bad for internet <laughs> stories, so don't rely yep. on them. All right, so um, let's uh, let's sort of bring things to a close with our our regular segment uh, where we talk about our picks of the week. Uh, these are any type of uh, technology related uh, ideas, apps, gadgets, what have you that uh, w that has grabbed our attention this week and that we want to you know share with you. Uh, this week, I want to throw it to Father Michael to go first. So what's what's your pick this week? So today is uh, Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of Lent. And something I saw kicking around on Twitter uh, that really it caught my attention and uh, interested me was changing your phone to grayscale for Lent. Uh, and honestly, I never even <laughs> considered that, oh, I can't turn my phone to grayscale because why would you? <laughs> um, but just the idea of it's really easy to get into the accessibility on your phone, make it black and white. Uh, it's a really good reminder because of how many times you look at your phone throughout the day. And every time you get there and you look, it looks kind of dead and drained of life uh, in black and white. That's a good way to remind you like, oh, it's Lent. I need to uh, I should be a little bit at war with comfort in my life. And so today's only the first day. I've only had it going for a day, but I find it. Uh, very effective, and I, I, I put for the show notes a good little article uh, from a website, thecatholictraveler dot com, and he called it a a first world penance. But it's not, <laughs> not that hard, but it, but it's it does something, yeah. Yeah, uh, Father Roderick von Hogan, who uh, one of the co founders of SQPN, he did this last year and was talking about how how it went for him and how like on Sundays he would put the color back in to his phone and it was like garish. It was like oh my gosh, it was so bright. <laughs> Um, but it for just so people know, for some people, it's an accessibility issue. They they need their phones to be in grayscale because they're they have color color blindness issues. And so both iPhones, uh, iOS, and Android can can do this. And and um, uh, the Catholic Traveler link has instructions for how to do it on on both. Um, and so this is a way for you to kind of you know to, to take a little penance. You still a lot of us still have to use our devices for work or what have you. But this is a way to kind of uh, to, to in spirit to, to to sort of fast from a color a little bit. So that's a good one. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Thomas. What's your uh, what's your pick this week? I had trouble picking. I had three that were like that I was juggling the whole time, but I finally <laughs> settled on one. Uh, thinking about how popular my first uh, space themed one was, I have another one for you guys. It's uh, called NASA's Eyes. Mm. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's really great. It's a visualization tool for space, and they have three different parts to it. There's a uh, NASA's Eyes on the Earth, NASA's Eyes on the Solar System, and NASA's Eyes on the Exoplanets. And uh, it's all one app. You download it onto your desktop. And when you click in, it gives you a full 4D view of stuff that's in space. Uh, so you can zoom all around the solar system, see all of the different NASA missions as they're moving. Uh, you can zoom in on the mission and it'll show you a, a picture of the thing in 3D. So you can uh, find the Kepler telescope and uh, look at all the different parts of it and see where it's pointing right now. Um, and it's it's fantastic. It will blow your mind if you've never really thought of even just the three dimensions of the solar system, being able to see Pluto's orbit and finally understanding why Pluto's not a planet anymore. <laughs> oh, that's is, is, is the only words. thing. If that's the only thing you get out of it, <laughs> then that is it's a phenomenal uh, download. One of these days I'm going to have you and Jimmy Aiken on the same podcast. And we can have a discussion about whether Pluto is a planet or not. He oh, is man. vehemently I feel, I feel that Pluto is a planet. About that as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, download this app and then look at the solar system from the side, and you will go, "Oh, 
well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, lots of people love that first, uh, the Space Launch Now and uh, app that you recommended before. So I'm, I'm looking forward to downloading this one and checking it out. I've Excellent. played with this one before as well. It's very impressive. Cool. So uh, my pick is a uh, web browser. You can think, hey, I've seen all the web browsers there is. Well, you might not have seen this one. This one's called Brave, and it's an alternative Chrome browser. So Chrome, Google Chrome, is the, is the, is the browser from, from Google, obviously. Um, and then the foundation for it, the underlying engine, is called Chromium. And there are a number of alternative browsers built on that. And this one is called Brave. And the, the idea behind it is, first, it disconnects from, from Google. Google doesn't get to see you know, everything that you're doing through the browser. But it also is, is designed, first and foremost, for your privacy. Um, it, there's lots of different uh, aspects to that. And, uh, it, it, but it's also uh, kind of hitting on something we talked about before. It is, they're trying to build in a way to pay people who, whose articles you read or whose websites you visit or whose content you, you use uh, through, through the, a, 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 uh, I forget what it's, it's a process built into the system based on the number of people who visit their site using the, the Brave browser. Uh, so it's an, it's an, you have to t take a look at the article. I don't, don't want to spend a lot of time talking about how it works, but I'll, I'll have a, a article linked to it that explains it. Uh, but it's a, it's a good browser. It's fast. It runs all the Chrome extensions. Um, it, 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 it's compatible like Chrome, so you can use it with uh, the Google Docs and Drive if you need to, all that sort of stuff. It's, a, and it, it's, it's just another browser to check out. Um, I've, I've tried to use Firefox as an alternative in the past, uh, but Firefox has this memory leak issue where it constantly is sucking up more and more of my RAM. And then like like a, a few weeks ago, it started going runaway, eating up my CPU. Uh, it would push it to 100. I'm just, it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there on an empty tab. I'm like, what are you <laughs> eating? Like, why are you sucking up my browser? I mean, my, uh, my CPU. So, it's a hungry uh, fox, man. It's a hungry <laughs> fox. Exactly. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, so that... And, Actually, Brave is uh, the uh, a, by some of the original Firefox Mozilla folks. They the they're behind the the Brave browser. So it's just a it's a nice browser, well designed, looks great. Check it out, see what you think of it. Um, and uh, you know it it blocks trackers, blocks ads natively, does all that stuff. It'll uh, automatically um, institute an SSL connection where necessary for secure connections. Uh, so it's it's got a lot of this stuff built in from the ground up, so you don't have to add extensions to it to get to do these things. So uh, so again, just that's my pick. I recommend you check it out and uh, see if you like it. So uh, as we close out, uh, first I want to you know thank our our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology. And today uh, we we always want to thank a handful of our of our patrons by name each week. And today I want to thank Thomas D, John B, Ted K. Bruce G and Kathleen H. It's through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give that it makes it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology in all the shows we do at SQPN. You can join them if you'd like by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And thank you very much. So that's it from us. What did you think of our discussion of the EU copyright law, Apple's coming news service, Momo, and our picks of the week? Uh, let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash StarQuestMedia. And uh, you can leave us feedback there. Send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. You can find the links that we've talked about in our discussion on our show notes at sqpn.com. Uh, remember, please remember to like the episodes uh, online, retweet them on Twitter, leave us comments. And if you have not done so, please subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app or YouTube where you should hit the bell to get notification. And if you can, write a review in iTunes or other podcast directories. All these things help us to reach new audiences and, uh, and to spread the news about this new podcast that continues to grow. And we're so grateful to have all of you listening. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate any feedback that you guys have been sending us. With. It's been great. Uh, so until next time, Thomas Sanderho, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. Thanks for having me. Uh, Father Michael Gossett, thank you as well. Thanks again. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest.